Chapters 21 and 22 of The Way of All Flesh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. The Way of All Flesh by Samuel Butler. Chapter 21. Strange, for she believed she doted upon him, and certainly she loved him better than either of her other children. Her version of the matter was that there had never yet been two parents so self-denying and devoted to the highest welfare of their children as Theobald and herself. For Ernest, a very great future, she was certain of it, was in store. This made severity all the more necessary, so that from the first he might have been kept pure from every taint of evil. She could not allow herself the scope for castle-building, which we read, was indulged by every Jewish matron before the appearance of the Messiah. For the Messiah had now come. But there was to be a millennium shortly, certainly not later than 1866, when Ernest would be just about the right age for it, and a modern Elias would be wanted to herald its approach. Heaven would bear her witness that she had never shrunk from the idea of martyrdom for herself and Theobald, nor would she avoid it for her boy, if his life were required of her in her Redeemer's service. Oh, no! If God told her to offer up her firstborn, as he had told Abraham, she would take him up to Pigberry Beacon and plunge the— No, that she could not do. But it would be unnecessary. Someone else might do that. It was not for nothing that Ernest had been baptized in water from the Jordan. It had not been her doing, nor yet Theobald's. They had not sought it. When water from the sacred stream was wanted for a sacred infant, the channel had been found through which it was to flow from far Palestine, over land and sea, to the door of the house where the child was lying. Why, it was a miracle! It was! It was! She saw it all now! The Jordan had left its bed and flowed into her own house. It was idle to say that this was not a miracle. No miracle was effected without means of some kind. The difference between the faithful and the unbeliever consisted in the very fact that the former could see a miracle, where the latter could not. The Jews could see no miracle even in the raising of Lazarus and the feeding of the five thousand. The John Pontifexes would see no miracle in this matter of the water from the Jordan. The essence of a miracle lay not in the fact that means had been dispensed with, but in the adoption of means to a great end that had not been available without interference. And no one would suppose that Dr. Jones would have brought the water unless he had been directed. She would tell this to Theobald, and get him to see it in the— uh, And yet— Perhaps it would be better not. The insight of women upon matters of this sort was deeper and more unerring than that of men. It was a woman and not a man who had been filled most completely with the whole fullness of the deity. But why had they not treasured up the water after it was used? It ought never, never to have been thrown away. But it had been. Perhaps, however, this was for the best, too. They might have been tempted to set too much store by it, and it might have become a source of spiritual danger to them, perhaps even spiritual pride, the very sin of all others which she most abhorred. As for the channel through which the Jordan had flowed to Battersby, that mattered not more than the earth through which the river ran in Palestine itself. Dr. Jones was certainly worldly, very worldly so, she regretted to feel, had been her father-in-law, though in a less degree, spiritual at heart, doubtless, and becoming more and more spiritual continually as he grew older. Still, he was tainted with the world, till a very few hours, probably, before his death, whereas she and Theobald had given up all for Christ's sake. They were not worldly. At least Theobald was not. She had been, but she was sure she had grown in grace since she had left off eating things strangled and blood. 
This was as the washing in Jordan as against Abana and Farper, rivers of Damascus. Her boy should never touch a strangled fowl, nor a black pudding. That, at any rate, she could see to. He should have a coral from the neighborhood of Joppa. There were coral insects on those coasts, so that the thing could easily be done with a little energy. She would write to Dr. Jones about it, etc. And so on for hours together, day after day for years. Truly Mrs. Theobald loved her child according to her lights, with an exceeding great fondness. But the dreams she had dreamed in sleep were sober realities, in comparison with those she indulged in while awake. When Ernest was in his second year, Theobald, as I have already said, began to teach him to read. He began to whip him two days after he had begun to teach him. It was painful, as he said to Christina, but it was the only thing to do, and it was done. The child was puny, white, and sickly, so they sent continually for the doctor who dosed him with calomel and James powder. All was done in love, anxiety, timidity, stupidity, and impatience. They were stupid in little things, and he that is stupid in little things will be stupid also in much. Presently old Mr. Pontifex died, and then came the revelation of the little alteration he had made in his will, simultaneously with his bequest to Ernest. It was rather hard to bear, especially as there was no way of conveying a bit of their minds to the testator now that he could no longer hurt them. As regards the boy himself, any one must see that the bequest would be an unmitigated misfortune to him. To leave him a small independence was perhaps the greatest injury which one could inflict upon a young man. It would cripple his energies and deaden his desire for active employment. Many a youth was led into evil courses by the knowledge that on arriving at majority he would come into a few thousands. They might surely have been trusted to have their boy's interest at heart, and must be better judges of those interests than he, at twenty-one, could be expected to be. Besides, if Jonadab, the son of Rechab's father, or perhaps it might be simpler under the circumstances to say, Rechab at once, if Rechab then had left handsome legacies to his grandchildren, why, Jonadab might not have found those children so easy to deal with etc. My dear, said Theobald, after having discussed the matter with Christina for the twentieth time, my dear, the only thing to guide and console us under misfortunes of this kind is to take refuge in practical work. I will go and pay a visit to Mrs. Thompson. On those days Mrs. Thompson would be told that her sins were all washed white, etc., a little sooner and a little more peremptorily than on others. Chapter 22 I used to stay at Battersby for a day or two sometimes, while my godson and his brother and sister were children. I hardly know why I went, for Theobald and I grew more and more apart. But one gets into grooves sometimes, and the supposed friendship between myself and the Pontifexes continued to exist, though it was now little more than rudimentary. My godson pleased me more than either of the other children, but he had not much of the buoyancy of childhood, and was more like a puny, sallow, little old man than I liked. The young people, however, were very ready to be friendly. I remember Ernest and his brother hovered round me on the first day of one of these visits with their hands full of fading flowers, which they at length proffered me. On this I did what I supposed was expected. I inquired if there was a shop near where they could buy sweeties. They said there was, so I felt in my pockets, but only succeeded in finding two pence halfpenny in small money. This I gave them, and the youngsters, aged four and three, toddled off alone. Ere long they returned, and Ernest said, We can't get sweeties for all this money. I felt rebuked, but no rebuke was intended. We can get sweeties for this, showing a penny, and for this, showing another penny. 
but we cannot get them for all this. And he added the half penny to the two pence. I suppose they had wanted a two-penny cake or something like that. I was amused, and left them to solve the difficulty their own way, being anxious to see what they would do. Presently Ernest said, "'May we give you back this?' showing the halfpenny, "'and not give you back this and this?' showing the pence. I assented, and they gave a sigh of relief and went on their way, rejoicing." A few more presents of pence and small toys completed the conquest, and they began to take me into their confidence. They told me a good deal which I am afraid I ought not to have listened to. They said that if Grandpapa had lived longer, he would most likely have been made a lord, and that then Papa would have been the honorable and reverend, but that Grandpapa was now in heaven singing beautiful hymns with Grandmama Allaby to Jesus Christ, who was very fond of them, and that when Ernest was ill, his mamma had told him he need not be afraid of dying, for he would go straight to heaven, if he would only be sorry for having done his lessons so badly, and vexed his dear papa, and if he would promise never, never to vex him any more, and that when he got to heaven, Grandpapa and Grandmama Allaby would meet him, and he would always be with them and they would be very good to him and teach him to sing ever such beautiful hymns, more beautiful by far than those which he was now so fond of, etc., etc. But he did not wish to die, and he was glad when he got better, for there were no kittens in heaven, and he did not think there were cowslips to make cowslip tea with. Their mother was plainly disappointed in them. "'My children are none of them geniuses, Mr. Overton.' she said to me at breakfast one morning. They have fair abilities, and, thanks to Theobald's tuition, they are forward for their years, but they have nothing like genius. Genius is a thing apart from this, is it not? Of course, I said it was a thing quite apart from this, but if my thoughts had been laid bare, they would have appeared as, Give me my coffee immediately, ma'am, and don't talk nonsense. I have no idea what genius is, but so far as I can form any conception about it, I should say it was a stupid word which cannot be too soon abandoned to scientific and literary clackers. I do not know exactly what Christina expected, but I should imagine it was something like this. My children ought to be all geniuses, because they are mine and Theobald's, and it is naughty of them not to be. But, of course, they cannot be so good and clever as Theobald and I were, and if they show signs of being so, it will be naughty of them. Happily, however, they are not this, and yet it is very dreadful that they are not. As for genius, hoity-toity indeed, why, a genius should turn intellectual somersaults as soon as it is born, and none of my children have yet been able to get into the newspapers. I will not have children of mine give themselves airs. It is enough for them that Theobald and I should do so. She did not know, poor woman, that true greatness wears an invisible cloak, under cover of which it goes in and out among men without being suspected. If its cloak does not conceal it from itself always, and from all others for many years, its greatness will ere long shrink to very ordinary dimensions. What, then, it may be asked, is the good of being great? The answer is that you may understand greatness better in others, whether alive or dead, and choose better company from these and enjoy and understand that company better when you have chosen it. Also that you may be able to give pleasure to the best people, and live in the lives of those who are yet unborn. This, one would think, was substantial gain enough for greatness without its wanting to ride roughshod over us, even when disguised as humility. I was there on a Sunday and observed the rigor with which the young people were taught to observe the Sabbath. They might not cut out things, nor use their paint-box on a Sunday and this they thought rather hard because their cousins, the John Pontifexes, might do these things. Their cousins might play with their toy train on Sunday, 
but though they had promised that they would run none but Sunday trains, all traffic had been prohibited. One treat only was allowed them. On Sunday evenings they might choose their own hymns. In the course of the evening they came into the drawing-room, and, as in a special treat, were to sing some of their hymns to me, instead of saying them, so that I might hear how nicely they sang. Ernest was to choose the first hymn, and he chose one about some people who were to come to the sunset tree. I am no botanist, and I do not know what kind of tree a sunset tree is, but the words began, Come, 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 come to the sunset tree, for the day is past and gone. The tune was rather pretty, and had taken Ernest's fancy, for he was unusually fond of music, and had a sweet little child's voice, which he liked using. He was, however, very late in being able to sound a hard C, or K, and instead of saying come, he said, tum, tum, tum. Ernest, said Theobald from the armchair in front of the fire, where he was sitting with his hands folded before him. Don't you think it would be very nice if you were to say come, like other people, instead of tum? I do say tum, replied Ernest, meaning that he had said come. Theobald was always in a bad temper on Sunday evening. Whether it is that they are as much bored with the day as their neighbors, or whether they are tired, or whatever the cause may be, clergymen are seldom at their best on Sunday evening. I had already seen signs that evening that my host was cross, and was a little nervous at hearing Ernest say so promptly, I do say tum, when his papa said that he did not say it as he should. Theobald noticed the fact that he was being contradicted in a moment. He got up from his armchair and went to the piano. No, Ernest, you don't, he said. You say nothing of the kind. You say tum, not come. Now say come after me, as I do. Tum, said Ernest at once. Is that better? I have no doubt he thought it was, but it was not. Now, Ernest, you are not taking pains. You are not trying as you ought to do. It is high time you learn to say come. Why, Joey can say come, can't you, Joey? Yes, I can, replied Joey and he said something which was not far off, come. There, Ernest, do you hear that? There's no difficulty about it, nor shadow of difficulty. Now, take your own time, think about it, and say, come, after me. The boy remained silent for a few seconds, and then said, tum, again. I laughed, but Theobald turned to me impatiently and said, Please do not laugh, Overton. It will make the boy think it does not matter, and it matters a great deal. Then turning to Ernest, he said, Now, Ernest, I will give you one more chance, and if you don't say come, I shall know that you are self-willed and naughty. He looked very angry, and a shade came over Ernest's face, like that which comes upon the face of a puppy when it is being scolded without understanding why. The child saw well what was coming now, was frightened, and, of course, said Tom once more. "'Very well, Ernest,' said his father, catching him angrily by the shoulder. "'I have done my best to save you, but if you will have it so, you will.' And he lugged the little wretch, crying by anticipation, out of the room. A few minutes more, and we could hear screams coming from the dining-room across the hall, which separated the drawing-room from the dining-room, and knew that poor Ernest was being beaten. "'I have sent him to bed,' said Theobald, as he returned to the drawing-room. "'And now, Christina, I think we will have the servants in to prayers.' And he rang the bell for them, red-handed as he was. End of chapter 22 Recording by Rhonda Fetterman